Harvard Divinity School. Your first heart is not in your chest, an African indigenous interrogation of the divine feminine, April 11th, 2022. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Mimi Winnick and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome to this afternoon's event, the penultimate in a new series on the divine feminine and its discontents. This series is part of a wider initiative the Center has launched on Transcendence and Transformation, or TNT for short. If you're interested in learning more about the initiative, please visit our website and sign up for our weekly newsletter. This particular series considers the complicated history of the quote, divine feminine as a scholarly and sacred category, asking whether and how it should still serve scholars and or practitioners today. Previous talks have considered these questions in the context of gender in modern Western esotericism, the divine Sophia in German idealism, goddess worship in pre-Islamic Arabia, and Tibetan Buddhism. The videos of these previous events are now available on our website. Today's talk, Your First Heart is Not in Your Chest, an African Indigenous Interrogation of the Divine Feminine considers the question of the divine feminine as such a sacred and scholarly category in light of our speaker's expertise in African religions and gender, and specifically from her ethnographic research with Luba women whose religious practices inform their positionality in war. Our guest for this evening is Dr. Georgette Mulunda Legister, who is a visiting research associate in the Women's Studies and Religion program at Harvard Divinity School and who was a 2020-2021 visiting fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, also at Harvard University. Dr. Legister's research lies at the intersection of African religions, gender, and conflict studies. Her current project focuses on African religions in general, and Congo and Luba religions in particular, as understudied sources of agency and empowerment for women in a context otherwise characterized by socio-political instability and precarity. A native of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Dr. Legister holds undergraduate and Master of Divinity degrees from Emory University, where she also earned a PhD in social ethics and comparative religions. She was a recipient of Emory University's John Fenton Prize for best graduate research in comparative religions for her ethnographic research with women who served as Mai Mai fighters and generals in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She has taught courses in religious studies and Africana studies at Harvard Divinity School, Emory University, Agnes Scott College, and Bright Divinity School. She is a co-chair of the steering committee of the African Religions Unit and a member of the Women and Religion Unit of the American Academy of Religion. Beyond the Academy, Dr. Legister uses African indigenous epistemologies to develop training models that assist universities, organizations, companies, foundations, and nonprofit organizations to develop the skills and strategies to tap into the creative and constructive possibilities of conflict. We are very happy that Dr. Georgette Molunda Legister has accepted our invitation to speak about her research and look forward to her presentation. Responding to Dr. Legister's talk this afternoon will be Professor Jacob K. Olupina, Professor of African Religious Traditions at Harvard Divinity School and Professor of African and African American Studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. An expert on African indigenous religions Professor Alupna's current research focuses on the religious practices of the estimated 1 million Africans who have emigrated to the United States over the last 40 years, including quote, reverse missionaries who have come to the United States to establish churches, African Pentecostals in American con congregations, American branches of independent African churches and indigenous African religious communities in the United States. His books include City of 201 Gods, Ile Ife in Time, Space, and the Imagination, and Orisha Devotion as World Religion, the Globalization of Yoruba Religious Culture. And his many honors and awards include an honorary doctorate in divinity from the University of Edinburgh, the Nigerian National Order of Merit, and the Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. 
We are grateful that Professor Alupana has agreed to serve as a respondent to this afternoon's talk by Dr. Legister. We have an hour and a half together. I will soon disappear from the screen and Dr. Legister will appear. She will speak for about 45 minutes and then Professor Alupana will appear to respond. After Dr. Legister has had a chance to respond further, I will be here to facilitate the question and answer session, which will finish by 5.30 Eastern time. Right now, I'd like to invite Dr. Legister to appear on the screen. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's almost good night for my mom, uh, who's here from Congo. Many greetings to y'all. Um, I bring you warm, heartfelt welcome from um, Atlanta, Georgia, the ancestral lands of the Muscogee Creek people. And it is such an honor to be in this space. To the Center for the Study of World Religions, Dr. Stang, uh, Dr. Winnick, and all the others who have um, put together this wonderful speaker series and have invited me to be a part, I extend my gratitude. Many thanks to Ariella Ruth for your support. And um, hello to my family, my siblings, um, those that I hold dear and those who um, I get to meet today. I hope to hear from you and hello to my WSRP uh, family as well. Um, let us get started. Your first heart is not in your chest. An African indigenous interrogation of the divine feminine. I first encountered Kilela Balanda on August 13, 2021. I was 39 weeks pregnant and anxiously awaiting the birth of my second child. A year prior, almost to the day, I had lost another child. Like countless others in many parts of the world, the pandemic had taught me the costly lesson of laboring, losing, mourning, and grieving without community. My husband and I had tenderly passed our grief back and forth to each other, attempting to ease one another's emotional load, as we would have perhaps handed to one another the child we would have raised. Our daughter watched something happen to us that her four-year-old mind at the time could not quite grasp. So she bore witness with impromptu hugs, stuffed toys that miraculously appeared on my pillow during naps, and by reading her bedtime favorites to me. Yes, Zuri can read and very well. I woke up from many of these said naps covered in toys and books, but always feeling a little lighter with hope creeping a little closer. As I prepared for labor once more a year later, my family braced itself for the process as one would prepare a weather beaten home in the pathway of an incoming storm, carefully, resolutely. On that hot Atlanta summer day, I was gently rocking the baby in my womb to sleep with the rhythmic movements of the glider in which I was sitting and chatting with my father via WhatsApp video. I could see the stark blue and white walls of his prison cell behind me, behind him. The fluorescent lighting washed out his skin, which stretched a little more tautly across his forehead and pinched in the corners of his mouth. He had been gravely ill the month before, month seven of unfair, unjust imprisonment, deepening our family's shared sense of terror at this unlawful imprisonment. The usual banter about how we both managed to sleep and what we had eaten the day that day had died down. He caught me examining his face in the lull of our conversation. So he quickly broke into a smile and pulled us both back from the questions we wanted to ask but could not answer. Me, when do you think you'll be released? Him, is the baby going to be okay? It had taken more effort in recent days to bat away answers that despair and trauma seemed ready to offer. Instead, my dad redirected the conversation and we let our silence on these subjects stand for hope. Have I told you about Kilela Balanda? He asked. Kilela Balanda? No, who's that? He smiled, and this time the smile reached his eyes and his mouth relaxed visibly. I haven't told you about Kilela Balanda? Oh, you will like this very much. I got excited. My father was a consummate teacher and a brilliant storyteller. I was proud to be counted among his students. Tell me, tell me. I was seven, 17, and 33 years old all over again. 
he chuckled. Kilela Balanda is the deity that rules the source of the Congo River. And you'll love this. Kilela Balanda is a female deity. I was hooked. The cell phones mediating our conversation disappeared. I was instantly transported to Kasapa prison in Lubumbashi. Why are you only telling me this now? I was squealing. He was delighted. So delighted, in fact, that his chuckle became a full-throated laugh. I know that knowledge like that interests you. By quote, knowledge like that, I presumed that he was referring to my insatiable thirst to learn about Luba tradition, indigeneity in the Cong Congolese public sphere, and most of all, the oft overlooked or undertold story of the empowerment and affirmation of women in African religions. I looked at him quite flatly and retorted a touch impatiently, of course. So who is Kilila Balanda? Kilila Balanda translates to Swahili as Muchungaji wa Maskini. Kilila Balanda sits at the source of the Congo River and is the deity who grants access to the Maskini to freely cross the river. You cannot cross the river safely without Kilila Balanda's permission. There's a street in Lubumbashi, the provincial capital, named after her. He paused to observe my reaction. I might have been gaping at that point. I was stunned. My father had opened a new doorway that led deeper into my education of the Luba and of myself as a Luba woman. He continued, there are many female deities in Luba tradition. We, the Luba, know this and don't need to speak of it because we know this. You might find it interesting, I cut him off. Absolutely. I had been scouring English sources for more information on Luba tradition and had yet to encounter any expansive study of the Luba pantheon. He smiled again and leaned back against the wall of his cell, which came back into view. I was back in Atlanta. He stayed in Casapa prison and the phones resumed their role in our conversation. You should study her. Add Kirila Balanda to your book. I definitely will. Sadness filled his eyes. It was time to end our conversation. I'm praying for you. You and the baby will be fine. How are you feeling? He asked, as if he hadn't already asked that question when we first began our conversation. I'm tired, but I feel fine. The baby has run out of room, but is otherwise fine. I paused. Thanks, Papa, I said, feeling the tears welling up in my eyes. I'm praying for you too, Papa. Thank you. I love you. Before I could finish fully forming the words, he had already ended the video call, as was his custom. My siblings and I often joke, and my sisters and brother are on here, and they can attest to this in the Q&A. My siblings and I often joke that if we want our father to say, I love you, we would have to start the conversation that way. He has never been enamored with goodbyes, much less goodbyes spoken in the context of acute precarity. I let the tears flow freely for a few moments until my curiosity drew me back to Kilila Balanda. True to form, he had piqued my interest just enough to set me on a path towards discovery. I started with the meaning of Kilila Balanda, Muchungaji wa Maskini in Swahili a name with plural translations and accompanying meanings. A, com a common English translation of Muchungaji wa Maskini, a translation largely influenced by the French, quote, le gardien des pauvres, is the keeper of the poor. At this semantic level, Kilila Balanda is the deity that lends protection to those in the community who are most impacted by economic inequities. However, the word poor or pauvre in French to signify one who is economically disadvantaged does not exist in Swahili, Kiluba, or Lingala. In fact, the fixed and individualized understandings of poverty in Western contexts do not translate semantically in the Congolese context. The communitarian orientation of the Luba communities or other communities in Congo and on the continent resists limiting poverty as the plight of a single individual. If one in a community is to be considered poor, 
The community to which that person belongs at best must bear responsibility for that poverty or at worst is complicit in that person's poverty. Being poor is not an individual socioeconomic condition. Here you have the French definition of qui est la balanda, gardien, meaning one who keeps watch. Um, protection is an important element of this definition or interestingly enough, surveillance. And pauvre, this, uh, the plural for pauvre um, has multiple meanings in the French and um, all of them are derivations of uh, insufficiency, lacking value and prosperity, indigent, needy, unfortunate, etc. However, in the Swahili, Muchungaji means guardian with an emphasis on protector or keeper. And the term maskini comes from masikio or ears and from the phrase sikiza wa makini, which means to listen intently or intent listening. And so the root verb is kusikia, which means to listen or to feel. In fact, etymologically, the term maskini originates from the term masikiyo or ears and the phrase sikiza wa makini. It's important to note that feeling and listening are the same word in Swahili, Kiluba, and several Bantu languages, effectively asserting that to listen requires one to feel. Consequently, activating the ear to listen concurrently activates the heart to feel effectively reducing the cognitive and physiological distance between the ear and the heart. As the Luba would say, quote, your first heart is, not, is on the sides of your head and not in your chest. The Luba are not by any means alone in forging an indivisible connection between mind and heart and locating that connection in the head and not in the chest. Roland Abiodun writes of the Ori and Ifa, the Yoruba divination system as the quote, inner spiritual head and the site of one's quote, prenatal lot in life or more simplistically one's destiny, which the Luba call Mulao. Abiodun draws from one day Abimbola's seminal text, 16 great poems of Ifa, where he recounts the journey of Afwape, the son of Orunmila, the patron deity of Ifa and his two friends, Orisheuku, the son of Ogun, the deity of iron and war, and Orile Emere, the son of Ija, on their quest to secure a good Ori from Majala, the deity who shapes one's Ori. While all three friends receive strict instructions on the, for the journey, only Afwape takes detours from the instructions to receive knowledge from his father, Orunmila, and to extend compassion to an old woman in need. Ultimately, Afwape disobeys instructions and yet is the only one of the three friends able to successfully secure a good ori or prenatal allotment. While Ifa scholars debate the moral of the Afwape paradigm, a cosmogonic myth anchored in an ethical dilemma between the obedience to instruction and order and disobedience in service to others, compassion is nevertheless a virtue that plays a key role in this text. The telos of existence therefore consists of discovering and securing a good ori or prenatal allotment or mulao. And that journey is marked with shifts, changes and adaptations that test the traveler in many ways, including their capacity to take a detour from their singular journey to extend compassion to others. It is this virtue of compassion that most closely encapsulates Kilila Balanda's sacred role as she presides over the source of the Congo River the ability to extend aid to travelers in need of compassion on their journey. By deploying an African indigenous hermeneutic to borrow from Jacob Olupuna, a process by which African traditions, practices and languages themselves provide the interpretive tools for uncovering meaning, it is difficult to conclude that economic poverty is the sole social condition at the heart of Kilila Balanda's engagement with the material world. While material poverty could very well activate Kilila Balanda's intervention, I contend that an etymological and sociolinguistic analysis of Kilila Balanda's name positions something more, what I contend is compassion or a lack of compassion as what draws Kilila Balanda's good graces and favorable, favorable action. It is the misfortune and not the unfortunate 
who seek to cross the river. Kilela Balanda grants safe passage at the tumultuous headwaters of the Congo River to the Maskini, people in need of compassion as they venture into troubled waters. As I reflected on the meaning and role of Kilela Balanda on that August summer day, I suddenly understood why my father has sent me on a quest to learn about this Luba deity. I was once again preparing to cross the churning waters of childbirth, waters from which some emerge and others do not. I was a weary traveler in need of compassion. I needed to meet Kilila Balanda. And with that revelation, I placed my hands on my swollen belly and wept. On degendering language about the sacred. My conversation with my father unfolded in four languages, primarily French and English, as well as some Kiluba and Swahili. Where English and French failed to provide us with the adequate semantic depth or curtailed or shifted expressions in limiting ways, we stuck with the source language. This code switching across entire linguistic systems was critical to our conversation because we were discussing gender a discursive concept that in Western contexts is held hostage by socio-political framings and implications. To undertake a conversation about gender in a Eurocentric language is a task that is fraught at the outset, as it requires interlocutors to acquiesce to the foregone conclusion that human existence unfolds in binaries, male and female, and that this binary is dependent on particular forms of acceptable embodiment. While the English language has since lost the gendered case to which Eurocentric languages such as French, Spanish, Italian still cling, the female male binary that informs the Eurocentric world sense has written itself so indelibly into Western moral consciousness that it not only impacts how one speaks and writes of the material world, this binary also informs engagement with the immaterial world. A simplified version of Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure's theory of semiotics might be most useful here. One can understand signs or symbols by using language or signifier to convey meaning signified about the sign. In a Eurocentric context, the linguistic tools that one deploys to make sense of a sign, a symbol, or an object predetermine the range of meaning one might make of that sign. In Western contexts, due to a built-in reliance on a male-female binary, extracting meaning outside of said binary remains challenging. This female-male binary in language is an extension and product of a broader framework of masculinity and femininity, or the assignment of role, possibility, and action in society on the basis of what is perceived as one's physical embodiment. While the implications become more, more weighty and even troubling when we unpack the complexity of constructions of gender in religion. Work that has been richly and effectively done by a long tradition of scholars of feminist, womanist, gender and sexuality studies and religion worldwide. A leading global program that exists to foster research at this intersection is a women's studies and religion program right here at Harvard Divinity School led by Professor Anne Browdy. If the language you use to locate and identify with the sacred is language that is burdened by and superimposes particular understandings of gender in the embodiment of the sacred, then how do we speak and write about deities like Kilila Balanda? The answer is quite simple for the Luba people. And in fact, the question is rather moot. Bantu languages like Kiluba, Swahili, and Yoruba do not possess a gendered third person pronoun. My father was clear that Kilila Balanda was a female deity, but our conversation revealed that that positionality only when we were speaking in English or in French, at which point my father would use a third person pronoun, she or elle. Being an ethicist and a scholar of gender and religion, my training prompted me to switch to Kiluba or Swahili anytime I felt compelled to use a third person pronoun in English or French. My own work with Charlotte Masanguankulu, known as Shati, a general in the Mai Mai insurgency of, Mal of Malimbankulu in the Congolese Five-Year War, taught me to resist the trope that what is female must also necessarily be feminine. To return to Olupuna's indigenous hermeneutics, I turned to the agility, flexibility, and expansiveness of speech from the life world of the Luba 
to glean and convey the meaning and the importance of this deity without assigning a role to this deity or qualifying the actions of this deity on the basis of gender. Luba epistemology or ways of knowing necessitated that I decenter gender in my analysis. And in fact, that I degender my speech and my writing about this deity. While African communities are certainly not the bastion of gender freedom, Shati's lived experience to, during the Congolese Five-Year War reveals the gender agility and flexibility in African indigenous epistemology and practice. A former warlord in the Mayama insurgency, not war lady, Shati gives an account of her life as a divorced young woman struggling with infertility before the war and her rise to the rank of general and warlord during the war as a result of her particular ritual engagement with the ancestors. The Mai Mai's infamy overshadows the sacred and ritualistic aspect of the insurgency, which is mediated by the ancestors and chosen leaders and activated by Luba deity in protection of Luba land and Luba people. The Mai Mai operate in context of war and yet their existence is part and parcel of the Luba social imaginary and of Luba life. However, because Luba religion and mystical political movements such as the Mai Mai remain understudied, the Mai Mai have been placed into the ill-fitting category of rebel movements and the ritual practice of its fighters has been dismissed as quote, witchcraft and quote, evil. The study of the Luba remains a largely Francophone and an increasingly Lusophone discipline anchored by the research of historians, Luba historians such as Mutonkole Lunda Wangoi, Banza Mwepu Mulundwe, and Florent Lukanda Wamalale. Malale's seminal text, Le Baluba, Histoire, Cosmologie et Semiologie d'un Peuple Bantu, provides the most comprehensive study of the Luba, expanding knowledge of the religions of Congo well beyond the well studied corpus of the ethnic Congo people or Bakongo. Not surprisingly, Yoruba religion provides an Anglophone indigenous grammar and framework for theorizing Luba religion. Diane Stewart's forthcoming text, Africana Nations and the Power of Black Sacred Imagination, the second volume in the Obia, Orisha and Religious Identity in Trinidad series, co-authored with Tracy Hux, unearths the impact of religion, language and political subjectivity in diaspora traditions such as the Yoruba Orisha in Trinidad. In doing so, Stewart does the important work of calling attention to the deep resonances, connections, and retentions between the religious traditions of the pre-colonial Niger-Congo re region, not just within diaspora traditions, but between African religions practiced on the continent to this day, such as Yoruba religion and Luba religion. Not unlike the Luba and many African religions, practitioners of Yoruba religion, including the Ifa priesthood itself, similarly wrestle with the vestiges of colonialism, particularly in the contestation that surrounds the role of women in leadership. Writing about gender and the Ifa priesthood, M. Ajeshibo Makelwin Abimbola decries the impact of colonialism and imperialism on African traditions, which not only historically embrace women as devotees, but mandate the inclusion of women in their leadership. And I quote, practices in Africa prove that women not only can, but must be involved in the Ifa priesthood. Excluding women from Ifa would be tantamount to disobeying a direct instruction of Oludumare, known as Vijay Shakapanga by the Luba. Yet conditions in the diaspora have led our male counterparts to reject women. I believe that the sexism that is found among Yoruba practitioners in the diaspora is a function not of Africa, but of the white supremacy and imperialism that unsuccessfully continues to try to extinguish the fire of our religion from continuing to enlighten our, enlighten our minds with its wisdom." End quote. In many ways, Ifa and Luba religion are traditions that exist in the tension between the liberative power of indigeneity and the sociopolitical reality of African communities and mindsets desperately in need of decolonization. When Shati became a Mai Mai initiate, she transcended the limitations of the role imposed upon her in her Luba community, which had heretofore only seen her through the lens of her inability to have children and to quote, keep her marriage. 
when Shati plunged into the world of the Mai Mai through a sacred and secret water ritual, she ceased to be Shati the woman and cautionary tale, and she became Shati the warrior, a militaristic identity often associated with men. In a ritual conducted by male chiefs and her own father, Shati accessed and wielded ungendered mystical powers that made her particularly fearsome to men. In one of the few structured interviews I conducted with Shati during my fieldwork, she recounted how her ascension in the ranks of the Mai Mai garnered her a fantastical reputation among many, and especially with men, and one with which she was not entirely displeased. The following is an excerpt of our conversation. Please note that some names have been changed to maintain anonymity, and I quote, Governor Bhutta did not recognize me the first time he met. She was referring to a former governor of the Banque Centrale du Congo or the Central Bank of Congo. He was looking for Shati, the Mai Mai, who wore red tights and a red bandana and hung the remains of the severed sex organs of the victims of her father's spiders attached to her thighs. He could not believe that I, and she pointed to herself with both hands, was the Shati he had heard so much about and had come to fear, end quote. This Shati was at once woman, warrior, warlord, general, divorcee, and after the war, adoptive mother and father to war orphans. Shati's induction into the Mai Mai ranks and her ritual practice deepened and expanded her once limited agency and role in society, decoupling her capacity for moral deliberation, action, and flourishing from her biological sex. I'm gonna show you a picture of Shati. Here in this image, the person in the very center dressed in all red, um, intentionally and ritualistically so, is Wende Shati's father. As you can see, Wende is, is wearing several amulets and holding ritualistic elements um, to signal outwardly his role um, and his connection to um, ritual power. And in the foreground with the vivid purple um, headscarf is Shati. And uh, I like to say this, um, when I first heard about Shati, when I met her, I was like, she looks like my auntie. And literally, she looks like she could be my auntie, anybody's auntie. Um, but this is the person that had garnered so much um, infamy. And she literally just showed up like herself. To be sure, Shati's embodiment and identity is one of a woman. However, as, my, as a Mai Mai, her power, influence, and agency were no longer diminished, nor even mediated by her body or her biology. The biological determinism that had locked Shati into a precarious existence before the war was subsumed by a more critical determinant of power in the African indigenous life world. The strength of one's connection to the ancestors and to spirit deities like Kilila Balanda. The somatocentricity of the Western social imaginary, to use Oyeronke Oyewumi's term, this heightened and even obsessive concern with the body, and more specifically the binary body, was no longer salient for Shati the warrior. Does Shati self-identify as a woman? Yes. Do the Luba no Kilila Balanda, the Luba spirit deity who rules the headwaters of the Congo River, and offers compassion to burdened travelers as female? Yes. Might African religions such as Luba religion and Ifa be included in practices that venerate the divine feminine? I would contend that to do so would be to forfeit the flexibility, agility, and liberative power that these traditions already offer women. And at this point, I will say wafwako, thank you. And it is now my honor to welcome Professor Olupuna, my teacher and my mentor, to share some comments with us. Baba, we are all ears. So thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, inform uh, the audience that I did not switch off my camera. I, I was suspecting that they didn't want me to be there to compete with Jojo. So uh, I can now have my turn. Uh, thank you, Jojo. Thanks to Nimi for uh, introducing me. 
and thanks to the Center for the Study of World Religions, where I am I'm talking right now. Uh, I have an office here. Uh, Jojo is a great uh, storyteller. I don't know if it is in the gene. He's not <laughs> just his father <laughs> who tells good stories. I think uh, Jojo makes ethnography quite fascinating to us. So I I really enjoyed um, you know reading reading uh, this paper. Uh, so let me also thank you for giving us this very very fascinating. Uh, an insightful presentation. And I can think of several possible uh, uh, titles, uh, you know, given the fact that you have uh, touched on so many things. Um, uh, this highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, lecture draws on many interlocking motifs and issues in the comparative history of religions, and also uh, gender studies. But time will permit me to raise just a few important uh, uh, issues, um, you know, at least um, in this uh, presentation today. Um, uh, the rich uh, ethnography of the Luba people and the Kilela Balanda story. Uh, it's very interesting. Interesting because uh, Kilela Balanda is presented as a sovereign female deity. We tend to avoid the word the king, which we borrow from, um, you know, from uh, the British, and simply call her a sovereign a female deity that rules the source of the Congo River. Uh, I can see uh, me, maybe my past, uh, past uh, academic uh, 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 life before I got to this, argue that she is probably the source of the Congo civil religion, uh, given the importance of this and the importance of sacred uh, kingship that she rules the source of the Congo River, quote unquote, is very important. So my response will follow the cue that uh, Jojo uh, has laid us, uh, particularly in what I consider to be a fascinating uh, comparativist mindset that uh, transverses the entire African uh, uh, religious and cultural spheres particularly the Yoruba and the Luba in particular, not to talk of the very, very insightful theoretical insights that he gave us and the methodological uh, 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 approaches that she uh, had used to uh, present these materials to us. Um, your conversation and exchanges with your dad particularly in the silences and the laughter that led to this revelation, uh, that led to asking the ultimate question. Uh, have I told you about Kilela Balanda? Uh, so your unveiling of this deity's biography should be limited also in that context of the conversation that started almost like uh, you know, a, 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 a conversation between a father and a daughter, but then led to a significant, uh, important uh, research that you have uh, shared with us. Now, let me uh, say that uh, most water or river deities uh, in Africa and in other places are generally female. Uh, Yemoya, Oshun, Kilela, Balanda, Ulukun, Oshara, etc. There are also deities uh, who have, in many ways, created wealth and material goods like coral beads, 
and so on. They govern and rule the deep sea, rivers, oceans. They maintain peace, but also fight injustice, violence, especially violence against women, uh, etc. That is very characteristics of all these uh, of these deities. And like Ilela Balanda, you have the story of Oshun, uh, as uh, uh, Jojo also also mentioned. Uh, where you see some of the borrowings in um, Bianchi's uh, 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 songs and music and how uh, Oshun uh, showed her other characteristics. You know, uh, I like singing that song, but I won't do that today uh, because time it was, is, is against us. Um, and I'm sure you, uh, uh, Jojo, you probably have had uh, me talk about Ajay, the goddess of wealth, as the one who created the banking system in indigenous Yoruba uh, uh, culture. Uh, uh, there are tons of narratives relating how the banking, the banking system, uh, how we started saving money. Uh, it was Ajay who did it. it was the, so um, it, it, the political economy, uh, uh, the the welfare, social welfare, all these things. These are things that women created. These deities uh, created, uh, in spite of all the things we say about uh, uh, male uh, deities. So why is there no uh, uh, expansive study of the Luba pantheon, particularly in English sources? You raise that question. I think I'm going to leave that to you to investigate. That will be part of your work. Uh, maybe in Kabera, I may want to discuss uh, 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 some of these things uh, with you later on. I have a feeling, uh, Jojo, that your dad, who is a priest, uh, I guess, yeah, it's a priest, yeah, belongs to the earlier generation of clergy, like my late father who promoted the study of indigenous religion. And on the, unlike the present situation, uh, the present day evangelical Pentecostals, who would discourage you and others from knowing about their past, about their culture, uh, uh, their forms of spirituality and their mindsets have caused untold problems and hardship in Africa. So it is very important that as we're talking about indigenous religion, we, we must look at it also in time and space. Uh, where is it that it's becoming very difficult to recover this ancient tradition and to, uh, to, to uh, be able to locate that in the, in the, in the present uh, thing. It is it to our advantage. I personally believe that one of the reasons why we are in trouble as a continent is that we have decided not to take seriously our own worldviews, our own epistemology. We are, we, are, we are going around in borrowed dresses and borrowed clothes. And as long as we continue to do that, well, we are not going to <laughs> be able to do much. This is the, this is the cost of our crisis. And, uh, uh, does that mean I'm asking people to go and convert to indigenous religion? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that even if you are Muslims or a Christian or whatever it is, you must take very seriously that worldview, that attitude to life, that kinds of thing, uh, uh, similar to what you mentioned about the, the meaning of communitarianism and the uh, reference uh, to that in your analysis of, of poverty, what you, you know, what you, you talked about. Um, and I think I'll probably mention that if there's still more time later on. I'm intrigued by how female sovereigns who lived in the water and yet controlled the world of the living humans have been able and successfully uh, 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 done so. A classic example is Ifa that you referred to earlier on. Orumila, uh, a central narrative, showed that uh, 
uh, Orumila left the world uh, uh, because uh, he was inv invited uh, by, um, he was invited uh, to uh, come to the, uh, to the deep uh, Atlantic uh, uh, Ocean where she he will continue to live his life. It was Olokun, the goddess, I mean, the, uh, of, the, of the river that invited uh, 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 him. What was also very interesting will be the, you know, the, the uh, what I may probably call the, the paraclitical experience. Uh, you see, Arumila just didn't live like that. He left behind uh, instruments of FIFA, gave it to his, his, his children, and say, you continue to practice divination. I am going, I'm going to Olokun's uh, uh, territory. So Olokun's invitation uh, meant that Orumila had to travel to the deep sea. The wider gender implication of this is that Orumila's last words, you know, let me call that, whoever you see, you call Baba, Babalao, that is, whoever you see is going to be the one to lead you. Uh, Orumila has gone to the home of Olukun uh, to live uh, maybe a second life. So the myth of origin of Ifa divination system uh, as relates to the conversation between Olukun uh, and Orumila is quite, uh, is quite rich, uh, particularly in the context of your analysis. Uh, Jojo, I appreciate your analysis of the uh, uh, what are probably what we probably call the embodied gender processes in Africa, and it reminds me of another important work, uh, Laura Grillo's uh, book *Ultimate Rebuke*, which was also published by uh, the Duke University uh, uh, series uh, uh, that that we we edit. And while I agree with your um, exploration of what poverty and the world war means uh, in the context of Congo and African cosmology, uh, 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 your attempt to dissuade us from limiting it to the narrow meaning that is often used in the West, uh, as that is as material uh, poverty, as opposed to the uh, its richer meaning, you know, in the Luba uh, uh, context as signifying communitarian orientation. I will also say very quickly that poverty uh, as uh, it relates to individuals' um, uh, uh, plight and concerns, a social economic uh, uh, condition that has left millions of Africans uh, really in abject poverty uh, needs to be reviewed. Uh, so my question then is that the African traditional worldview uh, that, that you uh, have cited and you rightly cited, uh, by and large is increasingly being changed by these traditions that I mentioned by uh, uh, modernity, by Islam, Christianity, uh, neocolonialism, uh, individualized uh, economic poverty is now the order of the day everywhere in Africa, in Congo, in Nigeria, and so on. So uh, that reality is very important uh, as we now look at the, uh, the total picture. Uh, I think lastly, uh, I guess uh, uh, your fascinating and perhaps what you will consider to be the most important part of this essay is the, the on the centering language about the sacred. I agree totally with your central thesis. Uh, here that there are ample references to how the centering gender or the gendering our words and thought may enable us have a clearer understanding of uh, the cultural phenomena that we are studying. I totally agree with you. We must, however, I won't say that, uh, understand how decades of colonialism have affected our views of culture. 
I think you made a passing reference to that, especially uh, religion. Um, since I'm also uh, at times interested in the centering, <laughs> you things I consider to be five, the most fascinating <laughs> that I've had. Permit me to raise uh, an issue for your consideration. Uh, and this has to do with the last, uh, the last, um, the last uh, sentence of your presentation. Let me read that, if you don't mind. Might African religions such as Luba religion and Ifa be included in practices that venerate the divine feminine? And I think, and your answer is no, right? So to do so would be to fortify the flexibility, agility, liberty, power that this tradition already offer women. Let me present uh, a, a, a case. Uh, the Ondo Yoruba people, the people I first studied uh, for my doctorate in the 70s, which I finished in 1980, uh, 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 turns out to be the only kingdom in the entire Yoruba uh, 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 sector that was founded by a woman. That was the only people called Pupupu who reigned till she was probably 500 years old, they would say tell you. And then there was either a palace school or whatever, and they gave the throne to the son, Airo, literally institute. And then Airo became a king uh, after, after the mother. Uh, the effect of this cosmology, this myth of origin uh, uh, on Ondo Yoruba society, is very, very strong to the extent that till today, the divine feminine is venerated by both men and women. After they had put in all their, whether in terms of material culture and, uh, 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 or whatever it is, after they had won their beautiful uh, Agbada and this thing, now they will then, following that, do what? Then they'll put the women's or jar, scarf, to show that that dressing is not complete. You know, uh, I just saw in my drawer here uh, is a cap I uh, did uh, to honor uh, our mentor, Professor Charles Long, when he turned 90. I made this thing uh, uh, in Nigeria, which I distributed and gave to, and gave to uh, our colleagues in the American Academy of Religion. An Ondo person, a uh, man who dresses without the mother's oja uh, is not seen to be complete. Um, so I'm wondering uh, why, uh, so the point I'm trying to make here, and you may want to uh, 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 disagree with me, is that does the divine feminine really, uh, 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 does the divine feminine mean something negative or what is it? What happens when men too share in that traits and that, and that um, uh, characteristic? So uh, let me just, uh, I think I should just stop because I know there are gonna be lots of questions for you. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to respond to this wonderful uh, uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. You have honored me with um, truly engaging uh, my work deeply and fully. And um, I will briefly offer some responding comments and then open it up for questions. Um, and Professor Abimbola is here. Um, so I'm fangirling a little bit that, you know, another professor that I quoted has come to the talk. But to respond to your uh, last question first, Prof, I think you're kind of making my point for me. Um, the language of femininity and masculinity locks us into these kinds of ideas and limits the, the forms of embodiment that um, African religions inherently transcend. Um, I would say African religions invite, especially religions that venerate female deities, they invite like a trans, um, trans embodiment of the sacred or a cross embodiment of the sacred. Um, you spoke about the particular tradition with wearing 
the scarf for us for the luba we do um, a lot of ritual dancing mutuashi is a dance that we do ritually and um and it's been popularized to just be you know this kind of banal dancing for entertainment but for mutuashi to have impact you have to take a kitenge or a lapa as they say in west africa and you wrap it around your waist first to dance men and women but men have to take a lapa from a woman to wrap around their waist in order to dance. Now, we are not concerned in, Af in the African life world um, about what happens to one's gender identity in the moment that you are in that ritual practice or that ritual act. It doesn't matter to us whether the body that is wearing the scarf or the lapa around their waist is feminine or masculine. That's besides the point. And I think that that's the point that I'm trying to make here, that our, tra our, tra our traditions that our traditions invite this, for lack of a better term, trans embodiment or a cross embodiment that um, categories of divine feminine don't necessarily, are not pliable enough to allow you to do that. Um, so that's what I offer as a beginning response, but you know, we can debate this um, back and forth as much as you would like, but I think you did make the point uh, that I was trying to make. And so I, um, I strategically did not answer no to my final question, um, but as, as you can tell from the response that I've just given you and from the paper that I presented, I do believe that the divine feminine is just not a, an agile enough category to um, to place our traditions in. It's not robust enough, it's not reflective enough of embodiment in our traditions. Um, and then a word about poverty. I think you're absolutely correct that individualized poverty is a reality. Um, it is um, very much um, a crisis that we need to encounter and to engage. And here, I would still say that we do need to return to an understanding of poverty as not just the plight of one, but the plight of all. If we keep that in the forefront, then we can raise the moral responsibility of communities to respond to the plight of those who are economically disadvantaged. We won't wait for our governments. We won't wait for our ministers. We won't wait for our presidents. We in the community that live alongside those who are economically, um, who are suffering economically, uh, we will respond to them because we consider them to be a part of us. So I think that there's much to be said about our traditions being unwilling to separate and the tension that it's causing with the rise and the spike of individualized poverty. I think our traditions would require us to respond and not just make it an elected individual's problem that we have the quote poor among us, whatever that means. Um, and then uh, last but not least, as far as investigating where uh, investigating the Luba Pantheon and building it out, um, that, that's a lifelong work. That's a work that will continue well, well after me. Um, and that is a work that, um, that is being done um, of, of just the Congolese religion, the Congolese religious pantheon, scholars like Dr. Kira uh, Daniels is in that work as well, both from the African diaspora perspective and from the Africa, African studies perspective. There are many of us, Dr. Sheila Otieno is in that space. Um, Dr. Uh, Oluma Thomason Oredain is in that space from the perspective of African Christianity as an African religion. So there's work to be done. Um, my small piece is the Luba piece. And um, it's it's just beginning. So there's translation work to be done, this constructive work to be done. Just wish me luck um, and keep reading my work and asking me questions and deepening um, the process. So that's what I will offer um, in broad responses to um, your questions and um, to really truly thank you for your wonderful affirming comments thank you. of my work. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
And I'm so pleased to come back to thank uh, Dr. Legister and Professor Alupina for this uh, phenomenal talk, Dr. Legister, and conversation. Um, I'm so very grateful. Um, I think as are uh, all of us in the audience as the comments and questions rolling in a test. Um, so I, I do wanna acknowledge that we have to lose some of our local audience to another event at the Divinity School. So if you don't have time to get your question, please, if you, even if you put it in the chat and we'll go to Dr. Legister. Um, but I do want to uh, start opening up the uh, chat questions from the audience. Um, the first I'll bring to you, Dr. Legister, is a sort of theoretical question from an anonymous um, participant who says, I'm fascinated by the notion of somat somatocentricity from Oye, uh, Oye um, and of replacing it. Uh, by say ancestor centricity, which I take to be an interpretation of your argument or an extension of your argument. Um, and this participant asks, can you comment further on the pros and cons of each approach and other possible loci for power? Wow, what an incredible question. Thank you um, to whoever posed it. Uh, ancestor centricity, I, I love it. <laughs> I'm here for all the wonderful coining. Um, I think that there could be, there's a lot there to work with. Um, and I also hesitate a little. Um, I hesitate um, because if the purpose is to allow these traditions to, um, to it, it's to write about these traditions in ways that allow them to keep their dynamism, their agility, their flexibility. I hesitate to come up with another term that would anthropomorphize the tradition in another way, right? I, I, I do not want to cast a body for the ancestors. And the ancestors are literally the disembodied living, right? They were alive on this side of, of eternity, of materia materiality, and they exist on the other side among the living in disembodied form. Um, so they retain, uh, those who venerate their ancestors retain very clear, concrete images of these people who once were and who now are in a different form. Um, so there's a, there's a, a, a um, a form of, I would say, embodiment. Um, and this is something that Kwasi Riwardu, who's a Ghanaian philosopher, would contend that there is a form of embodiment to the disembodied, to um, the, the, the spiritual, to um, the immaterial. Um, but he doesn't make that point, you know, he only makes that point to, uh, with, with certain limits and reservations. So we could consider that. Um, I think too, um, the somatocentricity, I think is, oh, Yeronke Yawumi is a beautiful writer. I mean, it just puts everything in perspective, right? This kind of centering of the body in, in our speech, in the West, in our disciplines, in our interactions with one another, in our social engagements. And I think what Oyawumi points to is the difficulty of removing a focus on the body out of our speech, out of our discipline, out of our scholarship. Um, and it doesn't, it's not a vilification of the body. It's can we give the body its own seat and allow all the other ways of being in the world to also occupy equal space, to have equal voice? Can we give all of our senses and not just our eyes that see bodies, can we give our ears also equal space? Can we engage with each other through other loci? Um, and I think and I, I resonate deeply with that, um, particularly because African religions are um, oral and textual traditions that really depend on the art and the science of passing down a story and being faithful to that story and um, retelling that story in ways that keep the tradition alive. Um, you know, so there's work to be there, there's potential there. Um, and I also think that there's the traditions themselves, you know, caution us to approach these methodological possibilities with care. Thank you so much. Um, a, a question now from uh, Nena Onima who says, thank you very much, Professors Legister and Alupina for this insightful talk. I'm interested in the idea of Kile Labanda's description as a sovereign rather than as a king. Um, 
considering, and this may be contentious, that the spiritual world of African cosmology is gendered and with consideration of Nwando Achebe's historical work on a female king in colonial Nigeria, I wonder why you choose a gender ambiguous term sovereign uh, in translation to refer to the monarchical reach of Kile Bapalanda. Uh, why is the goddess gendered spiritually as female, but as a ruler in the physical, you use a degendered term. I'm still thinking of the gender balance theory of Achebe that posits that male gods have female priestesses who may not be uh, biologically female, so-called, but identify as women and vice versa? That's a fascinating question. I'm going to begin um, with the response and allow Professor Lupina also to chime in um, before Professor Lupina leaves for the next talk. Um, you know, I the the importance of the way that we perceive embodiment um, ties directly to the way that we practice our devotion to that particular deity. Um, what I love about the language of sovereign that Professor Lupuna has introduced um, to my work on Kilila Balanda um, is that it allows us to consider rulership as not just being something that is permitted to women um, by using the language of, you can also have a female king. There's something to be said when the monarchy itself is fluid. There's something to be said when the monarchy itself is agile. There's something to be said um, about how to speak of monarchy, how to speak of rulership, um, in terms and in understandings that are indigenous and not just imported. The concept of king is an imported concept as Professor Lupuna mentioned in his remarks. So how do we, given these traditions, as you rightfully pointed out, how do we speak of traditions that have, that include um, priesthoods in which men, people who identify biologically as men serve as a priestess? How do we speak of these kinds of practices and in sacred and ritualistic engagements without necessarily defaulting to our colonially inherited terms? And I find that the term sovereign really offers us that kind of semantic suppleness that um, our inherited language and orthographies from the West don't. Um, and I'll stop right there and see, uh, Prof, since you started that fight, if you want to say something about that. Well, I think you've answered, you have answered the question. Uh, I may just uh, add to it that it was my own experience in 1979 when I was doing a study among these Ondo Yoruba people. And at that time, gender wasn't really, I mean, when I was in graduate school in the 70s, gender wasn't really central to our training in the study of religion to the extent that I had to encourage the Harvard students Elizabeth E. to now return to that same Ondo people and look at women and gender uh, relations. Mm. Uh, uh, and so when they mentioned the word Pupupu, I had written in my note, uh, a Pupupu was called Oba Obiri, you know, um, a woman king. I mean, then I wrote queen and the chiefs were very angry with me. They looked at me and said, say, doctor, no, 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 no. You know, so I began to think about it. And I think uh, the, the world sovereign uh, is, is better in terms of the context in which uh, whether it's a, a male king or, or female king, as we often uh, see them in uh, the Eastern Yoruba uh, uh, region, uh, will fit into that without any, any problem. Then, of course, the idea of, 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 of sovereign king associated with British and the, and the Europeans is, for me, I, I just, uh, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's appropriate for our own situation. Thank you both. Um, I want to... Uh... Uh, bring in a question from Melissa uh, DZ that um, opens up um, or, oh, we've lost Jojo for a minute. <laughs> Let's see if we can get her back <laughs> um, before I try to pose her another question. 
Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Alupana, in the meantime, I will pass on um, another question to you um, while we wait for Dr. Legister to return. Um, and this is a question that has to do with uh, Christianity uh, from an anonymous attendee um, for both you and Dr. Legister. Um, oh, and she's back. Great, welcome back. Um, so uh, a quick, a uh, question about um, Christianity for both of you um, from an anonymous participant. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and history in order to connect us with this subject matter. Do you see a correlation with modern day Christianity to the return of the non-binary view of the divine? No longer, call, for example, no longer calling God he, but father, mother, friend, peace, even God. Um, and I would amend to this in light of um, uh, Professor Alupina's particular expertise as well, um, if, whether this seems to apply in Christianity in Africa or the African diaspora. Well, as Professor Alupina alluded to, and um, as scholars of African Christianity contend, um, you know, e evangelicalism and Pentecostalism on the continent um, is thriving, right? Um, the Pentecostal evangelical churches in the global South are the future of those traditions. And, um, and those traditions very much are still resistant to changes that are perceived as sociopolitical um, Western influence. Um, so there's this strong and stark demarcation between um, you know, what is an import um, of, um, of the West that is trying to become more woke, so to speak, or, or quote progressive, and um, what is true to Christianity on the continent. I think what makes it, what, what, is, what is lost in that uh, binary, what is lost in that binary of what is Western and, um, and what is not Christian enough is that um, our languages themselves, our languages, which are some of the most readily available interpretive tools that we retain of our indigeneity, our languages themselves indicate, give us hints that in um, speaking and writing of the divine, because of the absence of this gendered third person pronoun, we've literally had to write and translate the Bible and include Baba or Father, literally, when speaking of God in the third person in order to gender God. So in our translations, in our own languages of the biblical text, we are literally gendering God in ways that are perhaps not uh, fully reflective of the Mago Dei, this um, theological doctrine and belief that all creation, um, that God created human beings in the image of God, um, which would imply that um, uh, the embodiment of a woman is also the embodiment of God. And, um, and we lose that. And I think we get caught in um, polemics um, I think that as practitioners, I consider myself to be a Christian myself, but very specifically an African Christian, meaning I am very aware and drawing from my past, my history, where I come from, how I live, how I've been shaped and formed, as Professor Olupana named. And in speaking about God, in praying to God, I've been attentive to the language that I use and the shift that happens when I do so in English when I do so in French, when I do so in Lingala, when I do so in Swahili, I've been paying attention to how, you know, I've had, I'm literally gendering, finding ways to gender God in order to pray to God. Whereas um, our indigenous languages give us an opportunity to engage with the sacred without necessarily having to gender the sacred. And so I would contend that this is not um, a Western innovation, right? Um, De-gendering the sacred is not a Western innovation. Um, we've been speaking and engaging and um, practicing um, our worship and engagement of our religions um, since time immemorial. But the gendered portion of it, um, we got from our Eurocentric languages. Um, not to say that the patriarchy does not exist and is not alive and well. 
on the continent and in these traditions. But we have levers, um, resources to draw from um, in our own indigenous traditions that I think the African Christian churches, um, not the indigenous churches, the Pentecostal churches steer away from. Well, if you are expecting me to add to this, I will simply just uh, say that the question relates to the use of language. Uh, when I discovered that in my own uh, Christian tradition, the Anglican Church, uh, they have totally discouraged the use of Yoruba language in worship. In, in the cathedral, for example, where people gather to, uh, to praise God on Sundays, uh, uh, Yoruba language that used to be the language that in fact was um, was the language of faith, uh, uh, which ultimately led to the translation of the Bible into a language that most people could read, yeah. uh, has now become almost like a kind of an abomination. Uh, I mean, the use of it in the church. So what does it tell us? It, says, it, says, it tells us that a number of these traditions are trying as much as possible to be like the Pentecostal uh, charismatic churches, um, and that uh, unless something is done, we are not going to be able to, you know, uh, retrieve uh, uh, this and be ourselves, as I mentioned earlier on in my uh, in my in my response. Um, I do not know how we are going to do it, and maybe uh, the uh, uh, president. Uh, 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 Kigami's solution uh, in Rwanda, maybe if you, most of you are aware of it, when he decreed that if you do, are not literate and you are not, you have not gone to a seminary, you have no business opening a church. As a result of that, he closed many, many, many churches. I've been interviewed on this thing and I said he did the right thing. Um, uh, and when you look at some of these performances and the kinds of things that these churches are doing, on the continent, uh, 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 they, 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 they border on criminality, really. And, and I think uh, it's important for um, uh, policymakers to begin to pay attention to this, this kinds of uh, development, which is not in the best interest of the continent. Thank you. So speaking of policy, I want to um, bring in a question that gives uh, Dr. Legister a chance to speak to her more public facing work. Um, and this is from um, Melissa uh, DZ, who writes, coincidentally, as I witnessed your talk today, I have been working on summarizing a house bill that is to ensure access to affordable housing in Connecticut and addressing the right to affordable housing for people of special circumstances. If, quote, poverty is a plight of all, and affordable housing is a problem, what kinds of practical applications can there be in sharing this theology and pantheon in the public sphere? How can this apply to human services? And she adds, how can sharing the stories and theology in the public sphere allow for understandings of cultural norms that these deities still have an ontological rulership over? And how might these norms apply to government? Oh, thank you for that question and good luck. Um... I, I wish you all the success um, in your important work. Um, you know, it's, it's important for, I think, to go back to a place where if you think practically, our lawmakers, um, where you make law is where you live. And so you have to contend um, for our policymakers, you have to contend with the relatively shorter distance between um, the law, the impact of the law that you make and the place where you live. Um, that distance is a lot shorter, right? So there's, um, there is the, the people who are most impacted by the laws that you make um, are not easy to overlook and to ignore. Um, now, does that mean that we have the best politicians in the world that live up to these indigenous virtues? Um, and moral understandings of community? Absolutely not. Um, I think that we learned well from our um, Western fathers and here I'm being very specific from our Western colonial fathers. And we have lived into, um, in our attempt to um, 
build quote democratic societies, we have reified the same injustices that we see in the West, we've reified them on the continent as well. But the, poten the potential lies in us really um, leaning into um, perhaps the intergenerational model of living that is still, um, is still extant on the continent, but it's also rapidly disappearing as younger and younger people want to become more, quote, more developed. Um, until, I will, I will not give away my age, but in my generation, um, you, it's still 50-50 where you'll find young people still living at home until they get married. So there isn't this kind of societal push to um, live and to step out on your own, incur debt to have your own while your family is there, right? So it, it kind of, um, you don't have these economic um, drivers to push one to individualize their wealth and to individualize their well being. We're at 50 50. I think by the time my children's generation comes up, uh, we will look very much like the West, where everyone is trying to have theirs, ownership, property, et cetera. And you know, there are advantages that come with that kind of individuation, but they're also um, you know, desperate at economic um, um, consequences and implications as well. So if you can think about, you know, what are ways that intergenerational housing can become a reality again in the West? During the pandemic, we saw a lot of that. We saw people who were facing lockdown uh, leave their apartments, you know, in Santa Monica, in New York, you name it and go back to family homes. We saw college students who left their dorms and went back to their families. There's this push to go back home in order to build this kind of you know, social welfare and well-being net as best as we could during the global pandemic. And now that things are opening back up, you know, folks are venturing back out, reclaiming their apartments, re-renting their own spaces, leaving the kind of family pods that they um, hunkered down in for two years that helped them to weather the kind of economic um, precarity of the last two years. Uh, I would propose, what would it look like for these kinds of intergenerational models of community building and housing? What would it look like to re reinstitute them? What would it look like um, to um, encourage, to incentivize um, housing and co-ops that um, don't differentiate by individual wealth? I think there's, there are models here that exist that we could explore um, and that could be corollaries to this um, you know, African indigenous ethos that I am because we are and we take care of our poor. Um, you know, I think we can approximate it, um, but it, it takes a lot of work because you are going to be compelling people to give up what they worked so hard for and what it looks like somebody else didn't work as hard um, to get. And that is a, it's an ideological shift that, um, that is difficult to change. I don't believe in impossibilities, but the, the steep, the climb is very steep to get um, at that sort of model operating here in the US. Thank you, Dr. Legister. So we just have a couple minutes left, perhaps time for one more question. Um, so uh, I, this is from my uh, colleague and Transcendence and Transformation and the Divine Feminine and its discontents, uh, Dr. Hadi Fakuri, who says, thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, and uh, do you perceive your work as a reconstruction and retrieval of the tradition um, uh, in a pre-colonial form? And, um, and then you kind of alluded to this already, but if you have more to say on the question of what you think the contribution of indigenous, indigenous African spirit traditions may be to your own understanding of Christianity. Um, you cut out a little bit there. Um, huh. Can you repeat that question? Yes. Thank you. Apologies. Um, <laughs> So uh, do you perceive your work as a reconstruction and, re and retrieval of the tradition you describe in a pre-colonial form? Um, and what uh, do you think is the contribution of indigenous African spiritual traditions to your own understanding of Christianity? Acknowledging we can't get to all of that. <laughs> of course. Well, I'm happy to say that it is not a retrieval. This scholarship is being done um, richly and widely. Um, I belong to um, the, 
newest generation of young African religionists, uh, many of us have been taught and mentored by Professor Olupona, Professor Diane Stewart, Professor Tracy Hux, Professor Manuel Larte, the list goes on, we are here. And uh, we are not the second, third, fourth generation at all by any stretch of the imagination. We are the newest and youngest generation. Um, and so we don't have to reach back. This is work, this is scholarship that is deep and rich and being done now. So we're leaning in, we're not reaching back, which is the good news. Um, and two, I would say, uh, you know, I would actually turn you to, if you would like a primer, um, I'm trying to find it, Prof. It lives on my desk somewhere. I don't know where it went, but there's a, it's, it's an Oxford series, a very short introduction series um, by Oxford. And it's a very short introduction to African religions published by Professor Lupuna is an excellent source to kind of get your feet wet. Um, the, I, I lifted up the two volume series that is being published, published by um, Duke University Press, the series that is edited by Professor Lupuna, uh, Professor Stewart and Professor Terrence Johnson. Um, it has been a, a publishing space that has privileged um, the religious experiences of African and Africana people and, and religious cultures um, using our own sources. We haven't had to do all of that translation apologetic work. So that series is robust, it is thriving, look it up. Um, you can draw so much um, from there. And um, I think what gives me hope is that this is not the work of, of past scholarship. Um, it's alive and well. And as far as Luba tradition, in the Francophone world, it is thriving. Um, it's scant in the Anglophone world, but in the Francophone world, it is thriving. I actually was able to get the contact information for Professor Luca Ndawamalale, and I stalked him a little bit on WhatsApp. And um, I will continue stalking Professor Malale until I get a conversation with Professor Malale. And I'm trying to enter, I'm trying to enter into that Francophone side. And, and this is the, uh, another piece back to language, how we have used our um, languages to divide us arbitrarily, um, disciplinarily, and we need to break down um, those disciplinary boundaries. So, and, and that is, I think a small piece of the work that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say that we've been here, we are here, uh, we are writing, the research is deep, it's wide, it's expensive, expansive, it's rich, and we will continue. Thank you. That is a, a hopeful note, but also a real note to end on. And I, for one, am grateful and look forward to being able to teach this talk in my own classroom, um, in my own disciplinary home of literary studies when talking about, about gender. So let's break down those disciplinary divides indeed. Um, there's a many, many more excellent um, questions and comments that we did not have time to get to. So I apologize, but, uh, but I thank those participants for sending them in. We will pass all those along to Dr. Legister and Professor Alupina. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and thank you so much to our speaker and our respondent for a rich conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much. Thank you. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.